First, let me stress that this particular video is not really meant for public consumption. This was made primarily for my own self. The reason why I made this can be sort of explained as follows. I keep on claiming that I have read Weinberg's Quantum Theory of Fields, or rather, its first four chapters much more thoroughly than I have read any other book in my life. Why do I say the first four chapters? Basically because every time I continue beyond that, I get distracted, something or the other comes up, and I have never really proceeded much beyond the first four or five chapters. Recently, I tried reading that again and found that some of these t ideas that were pretty clear to me the last time I read it seem pretty difficult all over again. So, I am essentially making this video as a sort of reminder to myself of what I understood of those chapters and hopefully, I will be able to push beyond the beginning of the book and try to understand the rest of it. Now, the Quantum Theory of Fields by Weinberg, three volumes, is of course a monumental book. Uh, there are perhaps other easier books to learn the subject from. And if you are learning the subject for the first time, I would perhaps suggest taking on some other textbook. Having said that, Weinberg's book is very clear very precise about its motivation and the only reason why it is perhaps more complicated than other books is that it tries to be as general as possible. So let's see, I am going to try to understand the stuff myself and hopefully if anybody else is listening along, this video might help them understand what Weinberg wants to say. Of course, that's no substitute for actually reading the book. So, please go ahead and read the, this book by all means. What I am attempting to do is try to understand this on my own. Now, Weinberg's first chapter is basically a historical introduction to the subject of quantum field theory. I am going to skip that for the time being. Maybe we will come back to certain aspects of that later on. I will start with the second chapter, which essentially is Relativistic Quantum Mechanics. And I'm going to quickly review Weinberg's description of quantum mechanics proper at the very beginning of this chapter. Of course, uh, much of this will be old stuff to all of you. However, I want to keep Weinberg's notation intact as much as possible, with some exceptions perhaps later on. And so, let us quickly go through what Weinberg says. So, Weinberg talks about quantum mechanics that was invented by Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Pauli, Born and others in 1925-26 to and has been used ever since in atomic, nuclear, molecular, quantum matter physics, etc. etc. So, he assumes that the reader is already familiar with quantum mechanics and gives a very quick survey of its basic principles essentially Dirac's version of quantum mechanics. So, the first thing that we have to note is physical states are represented by what are called rays in Hilbert space. So, what exactly is in Hilbert space? 
So a Hilbert space essentially is a complex vector space which means that given any two of its elements, let's say phi and psi which belongs to the Hilbert space, any linear combination of phi and psi with complex coefficients zeta phi plus eta psi where zeta and eta are complex numbers will also belong to the vector space. That's not all. It has to have an inner product. So that's what additional feature a Hilbert space has. It's an inner product space. That is, there's a particular operation called the inner product defined on it. And in addition to that, there is a technical demand, which is it has to be Cauchy complete. That is, if you have a Cauchy sequence of vectors in this Hilbert space, then there has to be a limit of that sequence in the vector space itself. That's a technical demand and is trivial for all finite dimensional complex inner vectors, inner product spaces, but for infinite dimensional spaces, which we often have to deal with in quantum mechanics, this becomes an important additional property. Now, let us focus on the inner product of two vectors in the Hilbert space. Basically, this is how we are going to denote this. I'm following Weinberg's notation. Of course, this is a standard notation anyway. So, this quantity, the inner product of two vectors pi and psi, is a complex number with the following properties. If you were to switch the order of pi and psi, we end up with complex conjugate of psi and phi. This function, which is this inner product function, which maps two vectors into a complex number, is linear in the second factor. So if I were to replace the second factor psi here by zeta 1 psi 1 plus zeta 2 psi 2, the result will be zeta 1 times phi comma psi 1 plus zeta 2 times phi comma psi 2. Well, an immediate consequence is that it's going to be antilinear in the first factor. That is, if I were to replace phi by zeta 1 phi 1 plus zeta 2 phi 2, and take its inner product with psi, we are going to get zeta 1's conjugate times phi 1 comma psi plus zeta 2's conjugate times phi 2 comma psi. This is not a separate property. You can immediately prove this from the first two. In addition, there is one more very important property, which is if I take the inner product of a vector with itself, I'm definitely going to get a num real number which is greater than or equal to zero. Note that because of the very first property, what is guaranteed is that the inner product of a vector with itself is a real number because it's equal to its own conjugate. And then saying whether it's positive or negative makes sense. So in order for this property to make sense, you actually needed this anti-symmetric property that we have stated at the beginning. By the way, mathematicians often don't call this an inner product, they often call it a Hilbert product. But for physicists, this is a perfectly good inner product. And uh, also, in many mathematics texts, the way these things are defined, it's defined to be linear in the first factor and anti-linear in the second. But we are going to follow the standard physicist version where it's linear in the second factor, anti-linear in the first. Of course, almost everybody who is listening to this knows the Dirac bracket notation. So they would sort of think of this perhaps as this quantity phi shy's inner product. But frankly, the connotation here is a bit more complicated because what we are saying in the Dirac notation is a corresponding to the 
the ket or the vector phi, you have a bra or a dual vector bra phi, which is acting on the ket phi to produce the number. This is equivalent to what we are saying here. The existence of the inner product essentially ensures that corresponding to every ket, there is a bra. But we don't really have to go there. And Dirac notation, while being a wonderfully useful tool for most of quantum mechanics, becomes rather unwieldy and complicated to use when you have non-linear operators, in particular anti-linear operators, which you may want to work with. We will have occasion to use anti-linear operators soon. And because of this, we are going to avoid, as does Weinberg, the use of Dirac's bracket notation. We are going to stick to the inner product denoted in this particular manner. And there's one very important addendum to this last property that I wrote down. Not only is the inner product of psi with itself greater than or equal to zero, the only way in which it can be equal to zero is if psi, the vector itself, is a null vector. So that completes the basic properties of the inner product. Now, at the very outset we said, the states of a physical system are basically represented by rays in Hilbert space. Not vectors, but rays. So what exactly is a ray? A ray actually is a collection of vectors each normalized, that is, with its norm or shy in a product with itself set equal to 1. But the important point is two different vectors belong to the same ray if so phi and shy belong to the same ray if there exists some complex number zeta such that phi is zeta times shy. In other words, you essentially take all multiples of a given vector, put them all together in a collection, and you call that a ray. If you want to sound mathematically sophisticated, you could say a ray is an equivalence class of vectors where the equivalence relation is defined via is a multiple of. But these are just different ways of saying the same thing. Why are they called rays? Well, just imagine that you were talking about ordinary 3D space. Then, for a given vector v, the ray corresponding to it, or the ray which it belongs to, rather, is a collection of all vectors which are multiples of it. That means a vector in the same direction, but maybe shorter in length, maybe longer in length, maybe even longer in length, or even in the opposite direction. So if you put them all together, what you really get is a straight line passing through the origin, which is what a ray is. Imagine ray of light. By the way, since we are dealing with only normalized vectors, this complex number zeta here cannot be arbitrary. It must have the property that mod of zeta equals 1, because only then will it ensure that when you multiply a normalized vector psi, by zeta, you are going to end up with another normalized vector. Now, this is about states. Now, physics really is about things you observe with states and their quantum mechanics has this concept of observables. Observables are represented, just like states are represented by rays, Observables are represented by Hermitian operators. 
So it's a mapping from the vector space to itself. So let's say A, which is a map from V to V, takes a vector psi to A psi. This has to be a linear operator in the sense that A acting on xi psi plus eta phi must be xi times A psi plus eta times A phi. But on top of that, you also need some technical assumptions about how A psi behaves as a continuous function of psi and so on. But what is important is that you must have a special property that's Hermitianity, which is, or rather, we are settling for a simpler to state property called self adjoinedness, which is actually stricter. That A must be equal to its adjoint, where for any linear operator A, you define its adjoint by phi acting on a dagger psi, so a dagger is this adjoint operator which acts on psi. You take the inner product of that with phi, the result is the same as A acting on phi's inner product with psi, or which is the same thing, psi, comma A phi's complex conjugate. So what we are demanding here is that A dagger equals A, what so that means for a Hermitian operator phi comma a psi is psi comma a phi star. That is, this operator which would have been a dagger is the same as a for Hermitian cases. Actually, for Hermitianity, all you need is this, that these inner products match. In order that a dagger be the same operator as a, you also need the domains to match, which is a technical additional demand. Strictly speaking, a dagger equal to a is called the self adjointness property, which is stricter than the Hermitian property. But once again, those are technical details that we don't really need to go into right now. What can we say about the values that can be observed in an experiment? Well, if a system is in a state given by a ray r, remember, Although we often talk about the state being represented by a vector, as we have already seen, it's not really a single vector, but a whole class of vectors which represent the state. Now, this is your state. And, and a state represented by a ray R has a definite value alpha for an observable represented of course by an Hermitian operator A. So we just say observable A although we really mean observable represented by the Hermitian operator A. Now this situation that the state has a definite value of alpha occurs if the vectors psi belonging to the ray has the following property. A acting on psi is alpha psi for psi in R. Note that since all the vectors in a ray are actually linear multiples of each other, if one of them satisfies A psi equals alpha psi, all of them do. So basically all you have to do is take a typical ray vector out of the ray and apply the operator A on it, see whether it's returning a multiple of that vector, then the multiplying factor is the observed value, also known as the eigenvalue. Now this is a very elementary theorem that if an operator is Hermitian, which is satisfies this, Alpha must be real. I'm sure all of you have done this theorem, proven this theorem in your quantum mechanics course. And not only that, the eigenvectors belong to different alpha are going to be orthogonal. 
That's again the property of admission, admission matrices. Now we come to our final statement about quantum mechanics. In particular, what is a, what do experiments really tell you about observable values in quantum mechanics? Of course, as we have seen, if the state is described by a ray whose members are eigenvectors of the observable, then quantum mechanics says that you have a definite value for that particular observable. What about other observables? So, first of all, let's say that we know the system has been prepared in a particular manner so that it is in a state represented by R. some ray. Now what you can do is you can try to test experimentally whether it is in any one of the different states represented by mutually orthogonal rays R1, R2, R3 and so on. Note that when we say the rays are mutually orthogonal that makes perfect sense because if you pick any vector from R1 and any other vector from R2, the two are going to be orthogonal to each other. So it does. So statement that the rays are orthogonal does not depend on which particular vector you have chosen from the to represent the given ray. So if you want to test whether R is in R1 with a state which is in R is also in R1, maybe by Testing for the value that is observed for an operator for which R1 is an eigenvector, R1 consists of eigenvectors, then quantum mechanics tells you that the probability of finding the system in a state represented by Ri is given by psi, psi i mod square where psi is any vector belonging to the ray R and psi i is any vector belonging to the ray Ri. Note that if you choose different vectors in the same ray, you are going to get different multiplying factors, but these multiplying factors are all going to be of magnitude 1, that is they are going to be pure phases. So when you are taking the mod square, those extra factors just cancel out. And of course, you take all possible mutually orthogonal rays into consideration, then you would have to find the state in some ray or the other. So you must also have this result that if you added these probabilities, you are going to get one. So this essentially completes what, according to Weinberg, are the basic postulates of quantum mechanics. We will then go on to talk about symmetries in quantum mechanics which is going to be very important of course. One of the major reasons of being that because we are talking of relativistic quantum field theory, the one major th symmetry that we have to talk about is that due to Lorentz transformations or their generalization, the Quarkai transformations. But before we go there, let's talk about symmetries in general.